I V M. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. India's very own travel podcast where each week we discuss the story of travelers in their own words and reel up their experiences with you our listeners. Hi guys, I'm your host Saif and our guest traveler today is Prachi Kagzi, an avid traveler who runs the travel startup Little Passports, a company that curates travel for kids. Little Passports is a novel concept in the kids travel space in India. and specializes in organizing tours for kids aged between 3 and 15 the objective is to promote the concept of learning by doing in kids and further strengthen the child parent bond prachi herself is an avid travel evangelist who has extensively traveled in india and abroad she has traveled over 45 countries and still counting She has been traveling independently since a young girl and has the sense of a world traveler having lived abroad in her formative years and thus becoming adaptable to new environments. After spending a good part of 7 years in the corporate world, she decided to break away and follow her passion, traveling. Little Passports has been featured in a number of publications such as Condé Nast Traveler, The Hindu, Midday, Financial Times and Bangalore Mirror. Prachi Thank you so much for being a part of the Musafir stories and welcome to the podcast. Hi Saif, I'm glad to be here. The introduction that I gave you is kind of short and sweet. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about your personal story and when the travel bug really hit you? Sure. So uh, I've been like a traveler from like a pretty young age because my parents were very active travelers. Uh-huh. So the first trip that I took probably out of the country was at the tender age of 4. and uh, i remember all my trips clearly uh, we would go to off the destinations at that time we wouldn't just go to europe or the us uh, my dad had a lot of work with uh, japan and south korea so those were my initial memories of trips that we did and uh, because my parents were uh, non conformist travelers we didn't uh, just take like a lot of off the trips but we did different things that I guess Indian families didn't do. For example, we would do like a lot of adventure sports, not just rely on Indian food or not, you know, carry this whole bag of Indian snacks along with us. So that helped um, get me into the travel sphere per se. And then um, I was lucky enough to get married to someone who was also an active traveler just like me. And uh, in fact, it was ironical because his map of traveled countries was uh, almost opposite of what i had done so we had a lot of catching up to do like you know places that i had been to and he hadn't been to and a lot of the world which we hadn't you know covered at all and then later when uh, i had my child i continued to do the same thing even uh, with my son uh, the first trip we took was when he was 2 months old and yes it wasn't to my mother's house as uh, it's pretty uh, <laughs> usual in india Uh, so we took a trip um, somewhere with my child, like a holiday uh, at two months, and then after that, I went actually to my mom's place, which was at age three months, and that's how I got inspired to start this. Excellent. So, uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, little passports. You did mention that you started travel early. Um, how much of that was an influence for you to start off with little passports? What was the story behind it? When when did you really come up with that idea was this after your son was born or did you always have this brainchild in mind that you wanted to start something like this when no, did, actually, when did you saw that uh, i didn't uh, have this brainchild at all in mind uh-huh. and um i would just travel with my son because of the sheer uh, you know joy of traveling and on these travels i started realizing that my son was learning a lot uh-huh. because um he wasn't going to any you know structured education system back then it wasn't like he was at school or play school but uh, when i would come back and uh, compare him to like his peers you know on play days or birthday parties or something and i would always get mums telling me wow your son knows so much you know he he knows so much already 
So I realized that it's not because I've been reading like some textbooks out to him or, you know, doing some flashcards or something with him. It was solely based out of all the travels that we had done. And luckily for us, we had done like different holidays with him, like seaside or like a jungle one or one to the hills. So he he had got a taste or like cities. So he got like a taste of a lot of things. So that's when actually the brainchild started coming in. I realized that he's learning a lot. And I had met uh, someone in Eastern Europe and we were just having a chat. So it was during that chat because he was uh, the person that I'd met was telling me that uh, how we should try and collaborate and do something together because he thought that I had this, you know, edge for travel in me. And that's when I thought that why not do something like this because there's nothing at all in India in this space. And um, I'm sure that, you know, now moms are so eager for their kids to get new avenues to learn. That's so true. That's so true. And um, even the statement, your earlier statement about how uh, travel makes even kids well-rounded and um, helps in their development. It's such a true concept. And as you mentioned, this is this is quite new in India, but back in the West and in the rest of the European nations, this is something that kids do pick up early traveling with parents, right? Um, yeah. And it does, as you mentioned, um, make them well-rounded, not just somebody who with uh, knowledge from the books, but otherwise just common sense and things like that, right? Um, yeah, and also, for the, I think that one of the factors is that in India, there is a myth which is embedded in people's mind, uh, which is that traveling with kids is harrowing. You know, it's more like a near-death experience. So, yeah, so I think, and obviously in the West, it's not like that because they have no help at home. So it's mainly like, you know, the family together and they don't have anyone to leave the child behind with. So I guess uh, it's more like uh, travel has emerged out of being necessity for the Western world and that's the reason why the Eastern world has been avoiding it because they had the sheer luxury of their parents looking after their kids or having house help to look after their kids or, you know, just getting plain lazy to do a lot of uh, things for their kids. And so I guess uh, because of this, it's steamed, uh, this ideology that uh, traveling with kids is just, you know, not like a pleasant experience. And also, uh, I guess that's where... Uh, it led to that ideology that kids really don't learn much when they're much younger, you know, on their travels, they don't remember anything. Uh, so I, I was basically out to break that myth through this uh, company. Excellent. More power to you. <laughs> so, Thanks, Seth. So Prachi, tell me more. Uh, how old is Little Passports now? Um, so Little Passports is just about over a year old. Yeah, so it's almost just on you know on all fours crawling now it's getting <laughs> um but yeah we've got overwhelming response uh not only from like parents but even we started getting a lot of schools who started um contacting us so it was uh very encouraging for us that uh we whatever we're doing we definitely have it going right awesome i was i was actually going to ask you that was my next question how does it work like do you reach out to people or uh, is it word of mouth how does it all work and how big is your team uh so my team is only of two okay and uh they basically help me just to market and uh sort of get the word out okay because um the main things, which is the research on the trips, is done by me, which is basically all the trips that I've actually done with my son. I want to just, you know, replicate them for the other kids. So yeah. every trip that I do, I don't make the kids on the trip like a guinea pig. I always go before with my son, do everything like a recce and know what's there for the kids to do and how child friendly the whole city is or the whole place is or the accommodation is or the attraction is. And, you know, what are like the ground ground level problems that we could face if they're at all. And after our trips are um, registered for, I accompany each trip, which has all the mums and kids. And um, I, I, I take them around. Excellent. Um, and how long are these trips usually, Prachi? And so they range anywhere from two days to seven days, okay. depending on where we're going. So usually the trips within India are like on an average two to three days. And the trips abroad, on an average, would be like four days to seven days. Okay. And then how does this work? Is any um, anyone open to sign up for this? Or do you work with specific schools for specific trips? Or uh, how does this work? So, um, 
anyone is open to sign up to this when i started out it was initially more like to empower the mums uh-huh. you know the mum and kids uh, because a lot of uh, mums are keen to travel with their kids but they weren't feeling you know uh, safe enough just to take off just you know them and the child right and uh, that's the reason why i thought that this would be a great start but uh, we were surprised that we started getting dads who were signing up so just mm-hmm. the dad and child uh-huh. uh, or aunts who were signing up who wanted to come with their nieces and nephews uh, on the next trip we have some grandmoms who signed up with their grandchildren uh there are no parents in tow at all so yeah it's it's uh, we are open to whatever is coming our way and then of course the family started coming in mom dad child all three mm-hmm. and of course we welcomed them also so it's it's very open we are open to anyone who would like to sign up and um, come come along with us awesome and uh, how big is your group size usually uh group sizes vary from 10 to What, like the largest group we've had was 45 okay. this is including uh, children and uh, adults okay and and uh, as far as your team is concerned uh, is it just you or do you also have uh, other help join you how's this so right now i don't want to dilute my uh, product offering uh-huh. because i guess that is my usp so i go along on every trip and i ensure that uh, this you know the experience that i'm promising to the mums and kids who come along they actually get that so i would do this probably for at least another year or two before i start training my team to go on these trips and by then i'm guessing i would build some volume and it probably would be physically not uh, easy for me to make it to each trip also right and um, then i guess the word would be out and people would at least know what sort of product to expect from us you know i want to make it like a standardized product that they expect from us so it would be easy for my team to replicate what i've been doing excellent how many trips have you done so far prashi we've done about like 10 trips okay. uh, which is india and abroad both hmm. so the first trip we started out with was literally just three mums and uh, we have like this next trip coming up which is about like uh, 15 mums nice so yeah the size keeps varying excellent Um so Prashi let me ask you this I, I mean it's as you said a very novel concept and uh, it's great that it's working out so far but I'm sure there would have been challenges that you've faced through through your time the year year and a half and since you've been formed uh, give us give us a flavor of uh, some of the challenges you faced so I get this question a lot and uh, it's uh, really surprising but my answer is that no I've actually not faced many challenges uh, initially as I told you the response has been overwhelming Uh-huh. and uh, luckily for me i think it's the concept that works because this concept sort of only reaches out to those moms or adults who genuinely are interested in their child getting some learning perspective you know uh-huh. they're not coming along with me for a holiday they uh-huh. you know we make it very clear because the itinerary uh, which we send out also sort of shows that that this is for the child we don't have any time for restaurants we don't have time for shopping we don't have time for like the most popular attraction if it's not going to be of interest to the kids it's not on it so because of this reason i guess the people who come along have that in mind and they've been more than accommodating and um, you know more than um, uh understanding about all our trips and we've had absolutely no negativity on any trips so the only uh, challenge i would say is that if a child falls sick during one of the trips mm-hmm. but before we plan the trips we always do a recce about where is the nearest hospital and if there's a doctor on call uh, mm-hmm. so we do have all those uh, uh, you know standards in place so i mean we have used them on occasions and but when kids are involved you really can't help it some kids do fall sick or i i guess it's the new breed of mums who are much more relaxed than the predecessors and they know how to tackle every situation that's true and i think it's also a reflection of your preparation because once you prepared and once you know what to expect that way um, you avoid any surprises and um, therefore any challenges i would say so good work by you and your team i should say yeah thanks so i i would give you a small example there there is um like one of the largest theme parks in india uh-huh. um there is also an, like a hotel chain attached to that who had all invited us that we plan a trip over there with kids but uh, when i went there with my son 
I didn't see a lot of response from the ground staff, you mm-hmm. know, for small everyday sort of uh, requests, which moms make because when they're with kids, they're more demanding than the regular guest. Mm-hmm. And because I saw that that was not being met, we never actually went ahead and did, did that trip. So I only go to locations which I'm very confident about. Like we do a lot of repeat locations where we see that uh, we are getting great uh, you know, uh, support from the accommodation or, you know, the place that we've chosen. So we like to stick to places which make us feel confident. Excellent. So on that thought, let me ask you this. From from all the trips that you've done so far, any memorable stories that come up to your mind? Uh, so there have been lots, actually. <laughs> but like, I'll just tell you one like, funny anecdote. Uh, so this is one of the trips abroad and uh, we usually like uh, hire like a, you know like a mini van or something to get uh, the families you know the transfers and all uh-huh. and um, so because it's kids right they would eat uh, all the time and uh, i think the travel company that i outsourced the van from it was like their personal uh, you know like they have a personal fleet of like just four vans or something so the travel company's uh, owner's wife, I think, had to ideally clean out the van every day. So she put up this note uh, on the second or the third day that um, please don't eat in the van. So there was this uh, one uh, little girl on the trip with us and um, she she got invariably hungry. And then uh, she was like, Mama, I want to eat. And the mom was like, no, we can't eat because see the sign up here says that uh, we can't eat in the van. And so very cutely, she goes, oh, so then let's just take the sign off. We can eat then. (laughs) Kids are their best, right? Yeah. So, yeah, (laughs) we have like a lot of uh, funny incidents on trips. And uh, we have a lot of like uh, encouraging incidents also. Like on another trip, uh, one of the moms was very, uh, she kept telling us that my son will only eat Indian food and uh, he will not eat any pizzas or pastas or, you know, any other cuisine. We try to variate, you know, the menus uh, during our trip. And there, there was one day which was like an Italian menu. So she was very worried. And still as a backup, we had got some khichdi made. But because he saw there were like at least 18 other kids who were like slurping on the pizzas and pastas, he was eating it too. And that mom was so thankful. She's like, I couldn't have done this like, you know, in like a hundred years. Because whenever I try to take him to a restaurant and eat, he won't eat. But because he got so charged up looking at everyone else eating, all the other kids, uh, he made those changes. Yeah, that, that is actually a part of it, uh, part of the travel experience as well, right? Not just with kids, but even with adults, you just tend to get out of your comfort zone and you try and experience the culture that is outside and uh, maybe from a kid's perspective, this was one little thing, so um, excellent. Yeah, in fact, the kids, like, they take maybe two hours to start, like, mingling. The, it's the yadars who take the full two days. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, the, the kids are like um, from like the word go. They they meet their friends and they they are playing and there's age no bar and sex no bar. We like on our last trip we saw the youngest uh, child on the trip who was a three year old girl mm-hmm. born uh, beautifully with a ten year old boy. So <laughs> it's uh, yeah they surprise their moms also many times. Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of beautiful moments uh, to capture on these trips. Um, and then uh, give us give us uh, an insight into the the trips you have done, the places you have chosen to take the kids, Prachi. Uh So we started out with a lot of focus on animals because uh, we see that uh, for sure, like you know, other than theme parks which are man made, mm-hmm. that um, animals are like the most exciting sort of um, sex for kids. You know, yeah. uh, they always get excited. They're very curious, very inquisitive. And uh, unfortunately for us, um, especially because I live in Bombay, we don't have a lot of access to animals because the zoo here is uh, not very well kept. Mm -hmm. There are very nice zoos in some other parts of the country, for example, the Mysore Zoo or the Delhi Zoo. Uh, But because uh, I started this out as a Bombay outfit, I was thinking more locally at that time. So uh, most of our initial trips were... Like the first one we did was to China, which was to a safari park. Mm-hmm. Or then we did to uh, uh, some national parks in India like Pench and uh, Taroba, uh, which are in Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra, respectively. So we started out with a lot more like focus on animals. And then it started growing like uh, to like more cultural things. 
or to adventure sports. So, like, we planned one in Rishikesh, which uh, did look at, uh, you know, whitewater rafting or mountain biking, trekking, things like that. Or mm-hmm. one which one which we do in the winter, which is uh, to Eastern Europe, which looks at skiing and uh, snowshoe hiking. And, like, uh, av- like, they have a treasure hunt with the avalanche detector. So igloo making so like a lot more snow activities Mm -hmm. and uh, then we also have like our cultural trips like for example the last one we did was to the northeast of India so we got you know we got to a tribal village which is really one of the most unvisited parts of India and saw how people were living their life there and we were actually still making cloth with hand you know using the warp web machine or uh, the next one that's coming up, which is to Punjab, and uh, we will make the children actually go to a rural farmland mm. and uh, partake in uh, farming activities such as milking the cows or plucking vegetables or accessing the tube well, you know, just something as simple as that. Beautiful. And I should say that's a really nice mix of uh, places and activities that you've chosen, and it's not limited to really one kind of activity. It's, it's a really good and diverse bunch of uh, places as well as activities you've chosen and it makes me want to join you guys on one of your trips. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, Seb. You're welcome anytime. <laughs> um, Only one fine print get a child along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the only issue, but yeah, someday, someday. <laughs> um, so, Prati, it's been uh, excellent talking about um, little passports, the whole concept and the um, projects that you've been a part of and things that are coming up. So I'd like to wish you all the best and a really successful future with this and all other projects that um, you work on. Thanks a lot, Seth. So Prashi, we have a little tradition at the Musafa Stories where each week when we speak to our guest traveler, we actually pick up a destination and speak about the ins and outs of it, how to get there, what to do, what to avoid what to eat, where to stay, everything from A to Z, literally. So we usually do that, but um, I'm going to do it a little differently this time around with you. Given your vast experience of traveling to wildlife sanctuaries in and around India, I wanted to uh, make this discussion about the whole process of preparing for a trip to a wildlife sanctuary and the things you do um, and everything else and your experiences from all the trips you've made. So give us, give us a little insight about your love with the wild and wildlife sanctuaries. Um, so again, I owe you know, my love for, the, for wildlife to my parents because they were the ones who started taking us to the national parks in India. Uh-huh. And uh, as I was telling you earlier that they were definitely non-conformist because I didn't hear of any of my friends really going for wildlife sanctuary trips in India at that time. It did pick up in the 90s, but definitely in the 80s, it was not that popular. So it's only because of that, I guess, uh, that I wanted to continue that experience uh, for my son. And as as I also told you earlier that uh, my husband and my travel map was pretty opposite. So he had, in fact, done a lot of Africa wildlife and I had done a lot of India wildlife. So he hadn't seen the the Indian side and I hadn't seen the African side. Uh-huh. So we, it was a nice way for us to sort of, you know, uh, look across. But yeah, the, the person who gained in this, I guess, was my son because uh, he would just come along for everything that uh, we wanted to go to. And uh, after we started um, frequenting national parks in India, my husband also became an avid wildlife photographer. So, uh, yeah, so I, I guess it sort of just put like uh, us, visiting wildlife more into the radar all the time. And then I guess your son is the lucky one here. He gets to see the best of both worlds in that case. Yeah, that's true. Uh-huh. And um, again, uh, just like me, I, I guess I've given him the seed for not only travel, but also being a wildlife enthusiast already. And um, also it's like uh, one of my favorite things that uh, the sounds of the jungle are the, you know, the best conversations. Because when you're in the jungle, you just hear the jungle sounds because there's so much going on. Initially, when you enter a jungle, you think it's silent. But it's only like after like 10-15 minutes when you get accustomed. It's almost like you're having this conversation with the jungle, you know. All the birds, all the animals, so much like the flora, the leaves, everything. Uh, Prashi, 
give us a flavor of all the wildlife sanctuaries that you visited and uh, which one has been your favorite one? There, there are no favorites per se. Uh, <laughs> there would be favorite trips, you know, uh, like uh, there, there is one um, which is itch, etched in my mind when we saw a family of nine, like a pride of nine lions in mm-hmm. Gir. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we had obviously the male lion, like the family head, yeah. and going down to a four-month-old cub. Mm-hmm. So when my guide was telling me, okay, look at the, you know, look at the cub, look at the child. And I couldn't actually spot it because I'm looking for a much bigger animal. And then he told me, try to look at the animal which looks like a rabbit. And that's when I spotted the four-month-old cub, which is so true. It, the cub actually looked the size of a rabbit. And, you know, you always envision like even a tiger cub to be sort of some, you know, ferocious, gigantic uh, animal. <laughs> yeah, like, so for example, of course, this was a nice one. And like another one that I would say is uh, this was in Nepal in one of the wildlife sanctuaries. And uh, the place that we were staying at is like an eco-friendly place. So they don't um, have any electricity. They're sustaining themselves because it's in the middle of the jungle or natural sort of uh, processes. So in the night, obviously, it's lights out and uh, the whole place is built on stilts. But we got, uh, we don't know which animal it was, but it was some very big animal, probably an elephant or a rhino, Mm. who was in some sort of discomfort. And this animal just came and started, you know, eating on the main stilts where the whole uh, accommodation was sort of built on. And uh, obviously, they rounded up all the guests who were staying there. And we were like sort of huddled in one corner. It was a bit scary. But yeah, I, I mean, today when I look back at it, it's one of the most you know exciting stories that I have to tell that uh, something like this was happening. And after about an hour, whatever it was, like the animal gave up and went away. But definitely the animal was not uh, out to harm us, but had some sort of discomfort uh, within himself. Like maybe he was uh, bleeding or like hit or we, we don't know what it was, but it was more like to calm himself. Yeah, but it sure would have been a nervous few minutes, right? Yeah, of course. Not a few <laughs> minutes. It was almost an hour into the night. And but uh, we were still thrilled enough to go next day on the early morning safari because, yeah, the hotel, like the accommodation thought that we would just not get up and go, right? They would think that all the guests are pretty uh, shaken up. But uh, we were still wanting to go out there and, you know, see the animals. Excellent. In terms of preparation and packing, what are some of the things that travelers ha- or um, visitors have to keep in mind not to miss out uh, on? So I I would like uh, give you from like uh, from a like a child's perspective because uh-huh. uh, that's what you know my speciality is that uh, uh-huh. the number one thing that I I really think that moms should look out for is from their disembarkation point to the jungle. How many hours are they going to take to get there? Because uh, usually kids get fidgety and, you know, they can't take those seven, eight hour long drives. And a lot of our national parks are really in the interiors. But having said that, we have a lot which are easily accessible also, which are not so far out and have like a great variety of wildlife to offer and have great like uh, sighting records. So they should do a little bit of research on that um, to start with about where they have to go. And then I feel the second thing is that they need to prepare the child to respect the jungle. Because um, not only are you actually entering someone's home, because the animals actually live in the jungle. So they need to understand that we have to be quiet uh, to respect the jungle by not throwing litter around. And if there is a animal sighted, to not overreact. I, I think that's like, you know, like a big preparation. And then... Lastly, I would say, is, you know, clothing and accessories that you need. Like if you're going in the monsoon, obviously take like a poncho along. Mm-hmm. Or if you're going in summer, it's going to be very dusty. So you should treat uh, clothes which could be easily wiped. Mm-hmm. And um, get those binoculars. Always wear close shoes on uh, safaris. Take like wide brim hats because the su- sun can be stellar for afternoon safaris. So basic things like that. Another small uh, point is um, kids usually make the best treat for bugs so they should definitely be sprayed with some repellent before they enter the jungle. Excellent. That's a really excellent piece of advice uh, advice there in terms of preparation and especially for tourists or travelers uh, traveling with kids. Um, and what are some of the activities that are your favorite, Prachi, well, once in a wildlife sanctuary? 
Um, so wherever possible, we t- not only, of course, we do these jungle um, jeep safaris, uh-huh. but wherever possible, I try to take the offbeat safari. For example, in Kaziranga, you can take an elephant safari, which is very few uh, national parks in India can offer you. Or alternatively, like in the down south, like in Periyar National Park, you can do a boat safari. Mm. So it's actually, you see the banks uh, of the jungle, you know, when you're on the boat. Mm. Or alternatively, there are some uh, national parks which even let you do like a walking uh, trail. So uh, there are parts in Rajasthan where they let you do that. So those are also beautiful because just to see the jungle on foot also is a very like thrilling experience. This is my favorite activity to not only do the jungle safari on a jeep, but to try and do an alternate way of seeing the jungle also. Other than that, uh, I love to talk to the naturalists over there because they're full of stories and um, we can't experience it all because we go to the jungle like maybe, you know, uh, once a quarter, but they live their life there. So the kind of uh, stories that they have to share and uh, their experiences of, you know, some other people, what they have seen, it, it's very nice. Excellent. So having said that, um, tell me your favorite jungle story. <laughs> so I guess I shared uh, one of my favorite ones. Um, those, those two are like the ones that uh, really stand out in my mind. I will tell you uh, another one. Uh, so this is uh, fairly recently and this is with my son. We had gone to a particular national park where a tigress had given birth to three cubs. So it was uh, like a different sort of experience because uh, she was trying to protect the cubs. So we knew like 99.9% when we go in, we will see the tigress and her cubs. We went like we got on the jeep, we went straight to where she was sitting with the cubs. And this was different in the sense because we got the cubs to see them playing. So initially what we thought was fighting... Uh, The cubs were barely four or five months old and one was an older cub who was seven months old and we thought initially that they were fighting but it wasn't, it was just the cubs at play and uh, it was just fun to watch that because the tigress, the mom was just sitting uh, near like this lake and the cubs were just uh, doing their own thing. So uh, my son was with me and um, to see his expression and you know to see the delight on his face to sort of you know see a counterpart in the animal kingdom do like their thing that was quite thrilling you know because this is this kind of stuff kids do you know when they're together and um, that they're playing and just enjoying life like you know and it's such a priceless home yeah so to, to, for me it was more not only to see the animals but to see the delight on his face that oh wow like you know they even uh, even the animal kids they play you know like they that sort of thing absolutely it's something to cherish for a long time yeah Excellent. Actually, it's been a wonderful so far and um, I'm sure a lot of our listeners and um, other people who listen to this, read to this, uh, want to reach out to you and know more about what Little Passports is up to. What's the best way to reach you? Um, so we are accessible by phone or email uh-huh. and uh, we that can be easily found on our website which is uh, www.littlepassports.in. Mm-hmm. It's not com, it's dot .in. Sure. Um, and our telephone number and uh, email IDs are there. Otherwise, we have an active uh, social media page on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter as well. Prashi, as we inch closer to the end of this journey, I'd like to thank you. Thank you so much for taking us through this wonderful trip and also explaining beautifully to us this whole concept of traveling young and um, making those little minds know more about what is around them and making more making them more aware and better human beings, if you ask me. So thank you so much for taking us through this journey and also to the journey through wildlife sanctuaries and um, what one should l- look out for in terms of preparation as well as activities to do. And all the best to you in your upcoming trips and journeys. Thanks, Seth. It was a pleasure to be here. And I hope I can inspire more mums like me to see the world through their kids' eyes. That was yet another great episode of The Musafir Stories. If you guys like the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes, Audio Boom, Stitcher, Pocket Radio or any other podcasting app that's available on iOS or Android. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We go by the handle The Musafir Stories or 
If it's so true, you could email us at themusafirstories at gmail.com and visit our website www.themusafirstories.com for more information. All of these links will be made available in the show notes section of the podcast. So here's to more traveling, sharing and inspiring. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, happy travels and goodbye.